In this video, we'll be talking about the crash symbol, how it works, a little bit about the history of it, how to set it up, get it in the proper position, and also how to play it without damaging the instrument or the sticks. The crash symbol is a part of the world's history in that it dates all the way back to the early 1600s where it was used by Turkish militaries. Believe it or not, the Zildjian family has been a part of all of that history. From the Turkish military bands in the 1600s all the way up to Beethoven in the 1800s to Gene Krupa, all the way up to modern drummers today, Zildjian has been making the best cymbals in the world. You can find out a ton of information about this at the links below. Check it out and read about the history of these instruments, how they're made, how they were used. It's fascinating stuff. Crash cymbals are generally quite thin, and the reason for that is because that way they respond quickly and the decay isn't too long. I would say the average crash falls somewhere in the 16 to 18 inch range, but there are so many different crashes to choose from. There are many different models that sound different ways. Some are brighter, some are darker, some have a long decay, and some have a quick decay. This particular symbol is a K sweet crash. This is a 17 inch symbol. And we call it the sweet crash because it has a sweet sound. It's right in the sweet spot between being on the bright side and being on the dark side tonally. Crash symbols have pretty basic stands. They're made up of the same kind of a tripod that we saw on the snare drum stand and then two posts so that you have more uh, adjusting ability for the height some older stands only have uh, one adjustment for the post and then there's a tilter here at the top to get the angle that you want out of the cymbal. Now it's important to not open the bass too far because these legs are longer than the snare drum legs and they can really get in the way of other stuff. And as you can see when you start to build a bunch of stands around you have to be sort of careful in where exactly you place the legs to get the optimum placement out of the cymbal itself. There are other types of stands called boom stands that we'll talk about in a little bit. But one of the most important things about a cymbal stand is this right here. You want to make sure that the cymbal is sitting on a felt and you want to have some sort of a sleeve so that the cymbal is not rubbing directly against the metal post. This protects the whole of the cymbal and will help it to not crack. And then you put another felt on top and when you screw down the wing nut, you want to make sure not to over tighten it because the cymbal needs to be able to move. In considering the placement of the cymbal, you want to make sure that it's in a spot that's easy to reach. Now, you're going to see lots of videos and photos of many hundreds of different kinds of cymbal setups, and some are high, some are low, some are all over the place, and that's all well and good. But to begin with, you just want your cymbal to be somewhere that is easy to reach, where you can just lift a little bit from the hi-hat. You're not having to lean forward to catch it. It's not too close where you feel like you're kind of locked in here. You don't want it to be too high where you're having to reach up for it or anything like that. Right here in a nice comfortable spot. You'll want to tilt the cymbal towards you slightly. If you have it flat, you run the risk of coming straight at it and damaging the cymbal or the stick. If it's tilted down too far, you won't really be able to get to the edge to crash it. So just a gentle slope towards you will give you the ability to crash easily and to play the tip of the stick on the top if you want to do that. Now let's discuss how to actually play the cymbal. It is incredibly important that when you crash a cymbal, you hit it with a glancing blow and you don't just bash straight into it. If you go straight into it as if you were chopping wood with an ax, you're going to break your cymbals and you're going to break your sticks. So you want to play the note, but you want to also bounce right off of it and get, get out of the way so that it can do its thing and sound great. Let me play a couple of different examples for you. Of course, you can also play on the top of the cymbal. 
Just like we play the top hi-hat, or like you would play on the ride cymbal, sometimes that's the perfect sound for the music. Crash cymbals also have a bell, so you can play the bell to get that type of sound, or for an even more delicate sound, you can use the tip of the stick on the bell. Generally speaking, when you play a crash, you're going to play it with either a bass drum note or with a snare drum note. Now, you're going to want to practice the stroke many, many times to get comfortable with it, to know exactly when that point of impact should line up with the bass drum or the snare drum. You can think about the shape of a J if you're coming from this way or a backwards J if you're coming from this way. Either way is appropriate to play the cymbal depending on where you're coming from or what you're doing. The crash cymbal is notated on the line right above the staff, which is called the ledger line. It's an X right on that line. So we're going to play some whole notes, which means we'll just be playing a crash on beat one, and we're going to do four with the bass drum and then four with the snare drum. We're going to do that, since we're talking about coming from the hi-hat, we're going to do that backwards J shape in all of these crashes. Here we go. One, two, ready, go. One other thing to note is that oftentimes the cymbal will ring longer than you want it to. You can just mute that cymbal with your fingers and it'll stop right there. One of the ways we incorporate the crash into a groove is by playing it on one and then returning to the hi-hat on the and of one. So you have to move pretty quickly to get back over to continue the groove. So it would look like this. Three, four, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Now, we're going to do this together and we're going to practice this, but I want to stress that you should almost never crash on every measure <laughs> when you're playing music or when you're playing with people. This is just an exercise for right now. So one, two, ready, go. Depending on the tempo of the music, you might not be able to get back to the hi-hat right on that and of one. So in those cases, you can just let the crash ring out for a full beat and then you come back in on beat two with the snare drum. That sounds like this. One, two, ready, go. One of the things that's nice about taking an entire quarter note with the crash is you can really accentuate the motion. And you know, drumming is a visual as well as a sonic art. So it, sometimes it looks nice and it feels nice to just really let that crash kind of hang. So let's do that together. And we're going to play a quarter note crash and then back to the hats on beat two. One, two, ready, go. Depending on the tempo of the music and how often you're crashing, you might not be able to make a big J stroke or a big motion. If it's a slow ballad, you might be able to make a big motion with your hand and have plenty of time to get back. Sometimes you got to hit it quick and get right back in. So it kind of depends on the context. The majority of popular music is in four, eight, or 16 measure phrases. A musical phrase is similar to like a complete sentence that somebody speaks. And in a musical phrase, you want to let somebody finish their phrase before you interrupt with a crash. Because crashes, although they can really support the music and help shape the form of the music, 
they can also be disruptive if you play them too often or if they're in the wrong spot. So you don't want to interrupt somebody's thought or their phrase with a crash right in the middle of it. That being said, phrases can be all different lengths. Sometimes they can be two bars, four bars, eight bars for one musical phrase, or even longer than that in some cases. That being said, let's practice counting some longer phrases. An eight bar phrase would be counted like this. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, two, three, four, eight, two, three, four. So now let's play some eight bar phrases. You can play this with me or you can listen and count out loud. Here goes. One, two, one. Two, ready. You're going to want to practice your crashes a lot. The reason for that is you want to be able to get a really good consistent crash sound every time you go for that cymbal. If you dig too hard into it, it's going to choke the sound a little bit. If you whiff it a little bit, it's not going to respond in the way that you want. So you just need to practice that motion with the bass drum and with the snare drum. You also want to practice putting those crashes in the context of a groove because when it comes to playing music, that's the way you're going to play them most of the time. And it's important to remember that there are all kinds of different phrase lengths in music. So sometimes you want to practice a two bar pattern or a four bar pattern and put some crashes in. You can put two, four, eight bar patterns together and make a longer phrase and put crashes at the end of those. You can do all kinds of things, just like with everything else we've done, different tempos, different styles, and mix it all together. But you're going to want to have a really good grasp of phrasing in music before we get to our next lesson, which is about drum fills.